Well, thanks everyone for sticking around for The Economist. Uh, I think the economics profession in general owes everyone an apology. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research that uh, I've been doing. Uh, I spent 15 years with the Wilderness Society in the Denver office and I spent a lot of times looking at the Rockies, uh, their economy and the economy uh, that's um, in many communities. Uh, let's see. So I started working on energy in 2001 uh, when the drilling boom started. Uh, the green line shows uh, in, in 2001 is natural gas wells. You can see uh, the spike in natural gas prices which started in California and peaked over uh, $10 in MCF, uh, prompted a boom in natural gas drilling. And that impacted the West Slope of Colorado, uh, Rifle, Colorado, uh, Pinedale, Wyoming got part of that boom. And, uh, and then uh, the price tanked in 2008 along with the economy and prices have stayed low since. Uh, right now, oil has picked back up above 90, so you're starting to see the rigs move from natural gas uh, to oil. And that in Colorado has moved activity from the West Slope up into suburbs of Denver. So as our speaker from Bill Barrett talked about, we're not dealing with elk and wildlife, we're dealing with moms and kids. A little different environment. So I started working on gas, and uh, let's take it from there. So I'm an environmental economist, and one of the things I focus on is sort of the externalities, the hidden cost of activities that don't show up in the market price. And this was my attempt at uh, categorizing some of the negative externalities with oil and gas development. And the idea is one of the heroic assumptions in economics is all the costs are included in the supply curve, therefore markets are efficient. And so the whole goal of environmental economics is to internalize those costs into our decisions. And so these are the categories. Uh, I won't cover some of the, the biodiversity ones, but uh, community concerns are where I'll, I'll focus my talk today. And one obvious one is just the truck traffic. It's a very truck intensive industry, has lots of, lots of impact on roads. And uh, property values are obviously a big concern in, in Boulder County. And uh, the one I'm gonna focus on a little bit is sort of the displaced jobs, sort of the crowding out of other businesses. So uh, this is a production possibility curve. And uh, on your y-axis, you have natural amenity jobs. On your x-axis, you have natural gas oil jobs. Uh, you could simply replace natural amenity jobs with biodiversity. It's the same concept. For a given plot of land, you have joint production possibilities. And you can produce a combination. And uh, the arc in this graph is the, what's called the production possibility curve. And ideally, theoretically, in economics, you line up the benefit curve on the tangent, it hits, and it shows you sort of your optimal allocation of resources. So you have oil and gas jobs at OG1 and natural amenity jobs at NA1. Uh, what happens though, the problem is that oil and gas doesn't occur in a vacuum and you have this sort of displacement effect. And if the scale of oil and gas increases from let's say OG1 to OG2, you lose some of the natural amenity jobs, just like you would, so you would have a, a displacement of jobs, just as you would have a displacement of wildlife if, if the scale of drilling gets too big. And I think this point down here about the difference between uh, short-term economic impacts and, and economic development is, is, is really key because you can have a short-term boom and get a lot of income and revenue and jobs shortly, but is it consistent with sort of your, where your long-term economic development path is going? And so uh, one of the things that's been occurring in the Rockies is what's called natural amenity development. And it includes everything, it's why we all live here. It's, you know, hiking, fishing, hunting, uh, ski areas, et cetera. And the map on the left is from the Economic Research Service recognizing the importance of natural amenities. They actually mapped it. And you can see uh, communities that are across the West that have developed based on their natural amenities. Estes Park in Colorado. Uh, you know, St. George in Utah, et cetera. Uh, but th so I, what I distilled down from the literature, and the last three slides of this presentation will have all the references, I won't talk about them now, but I sort of distilled down sort of the four features of the natural amenity economy. You have a high-skilled labor force. People want to live in a nice place. And so people move to a nice place, and then lots of times the jobs follow because you have a talented workforce. Uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs who want to start their own business want to live in a nice place. 
uh, they can be attracted to communities. Uh, the, a traditional one that people think about more is sort of the recreation and tourism based businesses, hunting and fishing guides, etc. And then a, a big source of income and wealth is retirees who move to communities because it's a nice place to live. So these four things are really have been going on before the, the, the drilling boom started in 2001. And so it, the natural amenities, we're, we're very lucky in the West, we have both natural amenities which can help economic development and we have oil and gas. It's a nice problem to have. Um, but, and so they really provide a, uh, they're not easily matched by urban areas. So it's one of the sort of comparative advantages small communities can have by making a nice place and offering these type of features. So this is a, a pie chart of total personal income in 2011 in the six state Rockies, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. And you can sort of see uh, color coded it a little bit in blue. You can see when you bring in reinvest investment and retirement income being about 31% of total personal income. And they're associated with the healthcare, which has been a very consistent source of job growth through the recession. And then uh, in green over on the left side, you can sort of see uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis has a satellite account for tourism. And, and these are the sectors that they include, include in recreation and tourism. And you can see that they're about 11% at total personal income. And then in red, I sort of included the high tech knowledge based uh, sectors of the economy. Uh, professional, scientific, and technical, 7%, information services, and management of companies. So those are sort of the three pillars that have been driving economic development in the Rockies. Now, it varies across the landscape. Averages don't apply to individuals, but in every state, you're going to see this type of trend. And then mining and oil and gas is about 2% of total personal income. So as the bajillion boom starts, you want to make sure you don't undermine these other important uh, components of the economy. So uh, my, my thesis when I was preparing for this talk was that Colorado is by far the most developed natural amenities economy in the Rockies. And Boulder County, where I live, uh, is a more mature natural amenity economy locally. So as you move from the first column, which is the six state Rockies, over to Colorado, over to Boulder County, you get an increase in dependency on natural amenities. And the trends show up because you can see in the professional and scientific and technical services how they're increasing as you get more towards the uh, right side. Same thing with information, same thing with arts, entertainment, and recreation. And as not surprising, mining, which includes oil and gas, is dropping. So as drilling has moved into these high amenity areas, you obviously have conflicts. And uh, you can understand because there's economic concern. In Boulder County, for example, there, we have too many people moving there. We have businesses that want to start businesses. It's just this hotbed of activity. And it's because we have a lot of open space and a lot of recreation trails. It's a nice place to live. You have a university, et cetera, kind of like here. So the question is, how do you uh, make this work? And so some of the current battles we have in Colorado, a battle at Mesa, which is west of uh, Glen Glenwood Springs, is a retirement community. And so now you have drilling outside the retirement community and some of the retirees are thinking about relocating. So you sort of have a displacement of economic activity. And uh, you have Carbondale, which is outside uh, west of Aspen. Uh, there, there, there's a coalition of mountain bikers, uh, recreation, uh, recreationists, uh, hunters, anglers, uh, ranchers who don't want to drill in the Thompson Divide because it's a very important part of their economy. And then in Boulder County, you have the town of Erie, where you had moms and kids out protesting when Encana wanted to drill about 350 feet from the school. Uh, Longmont, uh, their city council passed a, a ban on drilling in city limits, which was immediately challenged by the state and by the oil and gas industry. And then uh, what will be decided next week is ballot question 300, which uh, prohibits hydraulic fracturing in city limits of Longmont. Uh, Boulder County, in the meantime, has had a moratorium on drilling permits while they update their land use plan and the oil and gas regulations. Uh, that moratorium will expire in February, and I'm guessing that we'll, the county will also be sued by the state and by the oil and gas industry. So we sort of have this conflict of this new west and old west colliding, and how we're going to move forward is, 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 is unsure. So in 2009, Michelle Hayfield and I published a paper on uh, phased energy development. This was following the 2008 bust of the natural gas market with the idea of what can we learn? How can we do this better? 
And so the idea is to sort of phase this in. Control, the, regulate the pace and scale so that you don't have that displacement of wildlife. You don't have that displacement of jobs. And you get on more of a sustainable path. So there's a number of ways you can do that. Limit the acres lease, limit the drilling permits, et cetera. Cap the number of wells you might want in your county. Make sure that the old wells are restored before you allow new wells. Those type of things. Uh, and it's really sort of phase development is sort of adaptive management. You need full disclosure of fracking fluid so we know what the heck's going on and baseline data. And as the one, uh, in, uh, one speaker talked, you know, BMPs are fine, but if you don't have budgets and staff for inspection enforcement, they're not quite as effective. So you gotta make sure you got this stuff in place, and if you don't, maybe you wanna slow down the pace and scale. So this is what it looks like uh, from a job perspective. Uh, the first one, rapid development, that, that occurs where all the drilling, that's a typical boom and bust pattern. You have all your drilling in five years, and, and then uh, everyone goes home. And, but you, you lose a lot of economic activity for a community. And I think that's the concern is when you drill so many wells really quickly, a lot of non-local crews come in and you lose a lot of opportunities for local jobs. So the whole goal is just to sort of slow the thing down so that you have you know, over a 15 or a 25 or 35 or 45. And it's all sort of a subject to what the, where the county's economy is. Some counties are gonna want a faster rate. Some counties are gonna want a slower rate. But the thing is, you, you have to look at the other things that are going on in the economy. So this is the, what we, what we uh, presented in 2009, which I presented it in Boulder. And the, the, the new change is, is the precautionary principle. And this has actually been adopted by the Boulder County Planning Commission in, uh, this, in August. And the precautionary principle actually came out of concerns over biodiversity. It basically says, you know, if there's a plausible risk, let's take precautionary action. Norman Myers back in the 90s was talking about the precautionary principle. There's lots of uh, agreements on protecting biodiversity based on the precautionary principle. And uh, the idea is that we need to take some precaution. If you just leave it up to economic, species will go extinct. As long as the discount rate is greater than the reproductive rate, it's economically optimal to drive it to extinction. So this kind of puts sideboards on economic activity. And so this is where the Boulder County is going. Um, the real challenge is that how do you operationalize the precautionary principle? It's been signed in a lot of agreements, but really operationalizing it has not been done. So uh, this is my attempt at trying to think about how I would operationalize the precautionary principle when it comes to oil and gas. So the, the guide is to do no harm, try to do no harm. So first question for me is, well, have we done any harm so far? So what is the current level of harm? Sort of backcasting. How many wells do we have? How many wells have been plugged? Have they been property plugged? Have they been restored? What type of problems? How much staff do we have for inspection? The type of things you want to ask so that you understand what your current level of risk is. Uh, and then you want to assess cumulative effects. I, I really think we're long overdue for a programmatic EIS nationally. Federal government needs a programmatic EIS on oil and gas. We've had over 400,000 wells drilled in the last decade, and the programmatic EIS, I think, is from the 80s. So that could be done, and incorporating a sort of a risk assessment into that would be good. Uh, making sure you have baseline data. Air quality is a huge issue in the front range. Uh, VOCs and, and, uh, and ground level ozone, there's studies coming out of NOAA talking about the high pollution in the Uintas and in the front range uh, from oil and gas development. Making sure you have uh, management indicator species. Some places we're just going to be off limits. In Boulder, you're not going to drill up in the Arapaho Glacier watershed. That's where we get our water. So communities might think about what places they might want off limits, core areas for wildlife, et cetera, and, and get in there early and talk about this. And I think it's really important to talk about other communities to see what lessons could be learned. Go up to Pinedale and ask them if they could do things differently, what would they do? Go to Rifle, go to some of these boom towns in the shale out east and, and think about some of this stuff and, and learn from um, past mistakes. Uh, but th that all sounds fine, but what you're going to need in addition to all that is in this fiscally constrained environment, you're going to need some economic instruments, some incentives. So to drive home that this is the right way to do it. So performance bonds, for example. Uh, performance bonds have not been updated since 1950. Just updating them for inflation would be a huge improvement. Performance bonds are there to make sure you have money to reclaim the site, to restore the site, plug the well, revegetate the landscape. 
Uh, something else I think counties would be interested in are site-specific performance bonds. Right now you have blanket bonds that are either nationwide or statewide. Well, that doesn't guarantee a county that there's money to clean up the well. So you might think about having site-specific assurance or performance bonds that stay with the site so that if drilling occurs near a county, money stays in the county to make sure it's uh, reclaimed. Uh, impact fees are being considered for, for road maintenance in the front range, a uh, huge deficit uh, where a lot of truck traffic comes in early. Um, one of the challenges for communities is uh, there's a revenue lag, so you have all of this sort of infrastructure cost when the, during the drilling phase, and then uh, somewhere down the line you're, you're hoping to get revenue. So that puts communities in sort of a, a fiscal bind of having this cost early with expectations of hoping that there's going to be no dry wells and some revenue. So uh, impact fees help, help bridge that. Uh, a contingency fund, uh, taking a percent of the, of the revenue and putting it away for a rainy day for when that oil spill happens or when that pipeline explodes. You know, something that leaves future generations with some funding to clean up our mess. Uh, mitigation credits, we talked about those earlier. Uh, a carbon and methane tax, you can't just focus on carbon. There's methane, fugitive methane emissions that are coming from app operations, and it's a very dangerous greenhouse gas, so you maybe want to tax. That's the economist's favorite solution, of course. Um, severance tax and royalty rates, you might think about uh, whether there's fair distribution of those to communities. You might think about increasing them. You know, these are public resources, and we're still giving them away like it's 1872. So we have fiscal problems in this country, and maybe you want to think about um, adjusting those. A and then the simple market forces. Uh, changing consumer preferences. You know, clean burning natural gas, well, maybe I'll put my wood burning stove back in. You know, when I was in school, everyone burned wood. Colorado sold 1.2 million cords of wood for firewood. Now we're down to about 30,000 cords. We got lots of lodgepole that could be used for, for pellet stoves or wood burning stoves. So we all pulled out our, our wood burning stoves and put in natural gas stoves and if consumer preferences change, we could go back. And I personally like cutting trees. And uh, se sequestration payments, we have this whole idea of sort of, uh, you know, uh, carbon cap and trade. Well, what about just buying the oil and gas that's in the ground and leaving it there? If you have these people who want to do something about climate change, well, buy it up and retire it. So you could just sequester the best sequestered oil and gas that's left in the ground. Uh, an interesting opportunity in Boulder is last November we voted to buy our own municipality. So the goal there, this is being pushed by renewable energy advocates wanting to really bring up wind and solar in, in solar gardens in, in the city. And we have an old coal plant that uh, is from Excel, so the idea was to buy it, convert it to natural gas, and then we can bring up uh, renewables. Uh, as I understand it, with coal you can get about 25% renewables on your system and you can bring that up with natural gas. And so is there, is there an opportunity, if Boulder does choose to go to a natural gas plant, to use our market power to say, hey, take care of those communities. We are, we'll set standards higher and, and you can't buy, we won't buy gas unless you're, you're green and green up the fossil fuel supply chain. I, I think what's coming uh, from someone will be sort of green certification. It's like happened in forestry. So you're going to have a certification process to say that this operation, you know, is, is sustainable, is green, and you could do the leads, you know, gold, silver, platinum type thing, and then consumers have more information and more choice. And I think that's what way markets work is better information. So there could be some market forces that could, you know, some combination of these instruments will probably be necessary to, to you know, to move forward on some of this stuff. So. When you think about you know, sustainable development and this sort of Venn diagram and the overlap and the idea is to sort of stay in that yellow zone, stay in that sustainable scale. Uh, but most of the sustainable development literature is based on uh, renewable resources. Sustainable forestry came out of the spotted owl debate. And it was all about growth equals harvest, let's make it more sustainable. And if you go back even farther, if you go back to 1800s, when you had high grading and cut and run, you had the birth of American forestry. And Gifford Pinchot was uh, promulgating what he, what he wanted. He wanted a regulated forest. Regulated forest in, for non-foresters, or you have, let's say you have a 200-acre forest, 100-year rotation, you cut two acres a year. 
two acres a year. You're looking at a sustainable pace and scale. So Gifford Pinchot wanted a regulated forest, and that's regulating the pace and scale of, of logging. So all, all I've been thinking about doing is sort of applying all this forestry background to oil and gas, and, but applying it to a non-renewable resource. So that's sort of a, a, a challenge, and I think it's sort of an interesting uh, research opportunity to sort of see how to meld those concepts. Uh, one goal I think we can all agree on is to avoid the resource curse, and this, is, this was uh, published in a paper by Jeffrey Sachs back in 20 years ago, where counties or countries that were more dependent on resource extraction had lower, slower growth. And, and, and in part, it was because of bad policies and too much emphasis on resource extraction. And then they ended up with slower growth and lots of problems. And, and, and Headwaters Economics a few years ago did a study in the Rockies that showed that energy dependent counties actually had slower growth, they had less diversity, they had more difficulty attracting uh, some of the retirement investment income, and they had less, uh, less ability to attract entrepreneurs and other things. So too much of a good thing is too much of a good thing. And so you want to have that balance and try to avoid uh, the resource curse. And I'm going to end with the land ethic because I think this is why we're all here. It's, uh, you know, Leopold had it right. And how do we take care of other creatures? And it's not an economic decision. It's an ethical decision. And if you look at the Endangered Species Act, it talks about an ethical responsibility to protect species. And if you leave it to economics, they're doomed. So what can we do to honor the land ethic when it comes to energy? It's, you know, slowing the pace and scale down seems like a pretty good start. But I think personally, um, the demand side is where we really need to look at. And all the supply side solutions, wind, solar, they all have these hidden costs. And we can, you know, we built an economy based on a buck 25 gallon of gas, and now we're up at 350. So tuning up the economy, looking at our own personal decisions, thinking about a consumption ethic, which would be very consistent with the land ethic, is by far the best thing we can do uh, to honor the land ethic, and I think from an energy independence standpoint, if you're concerned about energy independence, then using less of what we have is a great way of doing it, while we let the technology catch up. So we started going into unconventional oil and gas, and we're pushing this technology, but it's not quite right. And solar and wind still has some way to go. So while we push technology on the supply side, really looking at tightening up on the demand side, I think would be really helpful. Lots of jobs can be created by insulating homes. Uh, reducing utility bills, et cetera. So there's a whole sort of job program that could come from demand side management. There's not much lobby in DC for that, but I really think it's where we need to go, not only uh, for the best, for help our economy, but to help biodiversity and, and the communities. So I will stop there and take any questions. So, so I, I, the question was, there's personal choices we can make, but I, I think the question was, what sort of our larger policy initiatives that we could launch? Is that what you're thinking? Uh, well, uh, my solution for the economy is, is that we have a huge debt problem, and a lot of that debt problem is because capital markets extended the housing bubble way too long. And so we have lots of people loaded down with housing debt. So why not refinance their house and incorporate energy efficiency into that refinance and we built a lot of houses really quickly, and they're all, a lot of them are very inefficient. So we, that would put a lot of construction people back to work, and it would reduce at the home. So there, there's one thing you do. The other thing, I think we need a lot of innovation on the transmission system. Incredibly inefficient, a central grid. So one thing we're talking about in Boulder is a microgrid, sort of connecting rooftops with renewable energy, overlaying the existing grid with a right of way, but building your own grid locally, so that if the grid goes down, you've got backup power based on renewable energy, a little bit more control. You know, when you're losing 60 to 70 percent of the power from power plant to load, and we're running out and we you know, have scarce resources, there's lots of improvements, either, either moving micro turbines closer to communities or, or improving the efficiency of the wiring or, you know, there, there's some technological breakthroughs on the transmission side, I think that would really help on that. And then, you know, fuel efficiency on cars obviously is, is a, a good one to go. We could certainly be more efficient. I had a friggin' Toyota Tercel in the 80s that got 35 miles a gallon, and we can do a lot better than that. So there's a couple ideas. How do you account for, how does your plan account for the backlash of the embedded culture of 
the embedded culture of consumption, the backlash. Well, um, actually a lot of the studies, uh, if you ever read the book Affluenza, uh, it's a really good book and it talks about when people, I think we've, we've had this conspicuous consumption looking for happiness and, and depression goes up. And a lot of the studies show that when people actually get off the treadmill a little bit, they, they, they're, they're happier. So in this economy, that may be their, they may be forced to do that, but um, I'm not saying people can consume, I'm not saying that everyone has their own choice. Everyone has their own ethics. I can't decide that for folks. I can just say, you know, we need to think about this. And I think energy, the energy IQ of the nation has come up a lot in the last 10 years with this drilling boom. And I think we can all, we just sort of took it for granted that they're drilling someplace else and I don't have to worry about it. Well, now they're drilling in the backyards of people or in wildlife habitat and now we have to think about it. So I think there's, there's an opportunity to raise the energy IQ and then people can make more informed decisions on their consumption. So I don't anticipate a backlash because I'm not prescribed anything other than here's some problems we got and here's a way forward. So yeah, good question though. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah.